The Working Preacher team holds you in prayer during this difficult time. God bless you for all the ways you are proclaiming the gospel, and may God be with you as you navigate this new way of doing your ministry. We believe that biblical preaching changes lives, and Working Preacher is the most direct way to provide support, encouragement, and assistance to biblical preachers. In this ongoing pandemic, many preachers may feel isolated, but Working Preacher is still there with preachers every week through the podcasts and the website to provide support during this time. If you or another preacher you know depends on Working Preacher, both for sermon writing and spiritual strength, now is the time to support the site financially. If you are already a sustainer, your increased participation at any level enables us to continue updating the resource to support preachers and lay leaders during this time when they need it the most. We could not keep Working Preacher up to date or even open without the generous support of donors, and I am so grateful for your help. Thank you for keeping Working Preacher working for you. Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Matt Skinner. And me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Rolf Jacobson. And me, Caroline Lewis. The text for the sixth Sunday of Easter, which is May 17th, 2020, are these. First, from the book of Acts, chapter 17, verses 22 through 31. Psalm 66, 8 through 20. 1 Peter 3, 13 through 22. And from the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verses 15 through 21. We are continuing our non-pod podcasting here uh, by a distance in our, in our video experiment as well. So see us on YouTube if you want to watch the video, which is equally parts thrilling and terrifying for me. <laughs> Agreed. Very exciting. So John 14, we... what do you got? Anybody been thinking about this passage? Oh, for well, you. I have, and I. Uh, it, this is, of course, a continuation from last uh, Sunday, and one of the uh, challenges often for uh, preachers of John is it when you, g you get into these discourses, like the Bread of Life discourse, and and of course the whole farewell discourse. It uh, the assumption is that Jesus kind of just says more of the same. And so you, uh, one has to be uh, hermeneutically uh, astute to see where and how you are seeing some different uh, things that are being, and different connections that are being introduced. And so the main thing here, uh, it, well, a couple of things. One is, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And which uh, is a reference back to uh, John 13, 34, and 35, the love commandment of situated within the uh, foot washing. Uh, but that love is this distinctive, this, this uh, kind of um, uh, abundant love that Jesus has shown his disciples throughout his entire ministry, not just at the foot washing, but the entirety. Uh, and love for, love for those you know, uh, who would betray you, uh, and so he washes the feet of Judas, and he washes the feet of his denier Peter. And so it's a it's a love that doesn't uh, that doesn't single out <laughs> those who would even abandon you. Um, you will keep my commandments. Uh, but one of the things it's like, well, how do we do that? Uh, going back to John fourteen twelve, how do we do these greater works? How is this even possible? How can we love like you have loved? How can we love the world? Uh, to which we are called to love. And the answer is the paraclete, which is the first reference to uh, the uh, advocate or the paraclete in, uh, in the farewell discourse and in the gospel of John in general. So you've had references to the spirit, but this is a unique, uh, unique pneumatology to John. I will ask the father and he will give you another advocate, another paraclete. And that that's really... Uh, the key phrase there in that Jesus understands his own ministry, his own leadership, if you will, as that of being a paraclete. Uh, and paraclete, literally the one who is called to be alongside you, can be translated helper, companion, aider, intercessor, advocate. And this paraclete will, the spirit of truth, will have all of those kinds of roles then going forward. Uh, in chapter 15, again, when, it, when, uh, when you have a, another discourse on the paraclete, 
and then chapter 16 again. And so that's the promise here. Uh, you know him, that is the, this is verse 17, you know him, that is the paraclete, because, because he abides with you, menos with you. And so this paraclete will take on the same uh, presence, the same abiding um, constancy, companionship uh, that uh, Jesus has, uh, has been for his disciples all along. And so that's what makes, that's what makes this uh, the capacity to love as Jesus loved or the, the, uh, you know, to make it possible uh, to uh, really kind of survive this uh, distancing or separation from Jesus. Uh, it goes back to, I will not leave you orphaned. Uh, and you will have the um, advocate who will take on these different kinds of roles depending on what you need. And that's the promise. Sometimes a guide, sometimes a teacher, sometimes an advocate, intercessor, helper. So it's, uh, it's a wonderful uh, pneumatology, a different pneumatology than people are used to, but it's a, it's a pneumatology uh, that is grounded in companionship and relationship and, um, and comfort and, uh, and, um, help so Ma emmanuel the god who has always been present is with the promises to be with us always mm -hmm. and and the abiding that that draws back to us that we spoke about the week before of of this many abiding places that this is what is being prepared for us uh, i love what you just did with that caroline mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think liturgically, uh, it, it's important because um, this following uh, week is the um, Ascension. So, so coming up on Ascension, um, it's important then uh, with Pentecost and the coming of the Spirit. The other historical reference, I'm going to take over Joy's role for this week. I got her permission. The historical antecedent that's important this Sunday, May 17th, is, of course, it's Soot and Demai, Norwegian Constitution Day, when my oppressed that. people finally, in 1814, uh, got our own constitution. Ya biel skirtetalana. Sorry, I, I had to take it on Joy's role of singing. All right, back to like the edifying word of God, though. So um, I'm... I'm searching for a segue here. Uh, but verse 18, I will not leave you orphaned, I am coming to you. Is the I am coming to you a reference to Jesus' appearance after the resurrection, or is that he's coming in the advocate, he's coming in the paraclete? Is this a way of John's gospel saying the Holy Spirit is the spirit of Jesus? And I'll explain why it matters, I guess, after the question. But see what I mean? The second half of verse 18, when he says, I am mm -hmm. coming to you. Yeah. Uh, well, I think it could be both, but I think in this particular context, uh, there is this um, kind of indistinguishability. <laughs> uh, is that a word? Indistingu indistinguishableness uh, yeah. between, uh, between what we get here and then even going forward in the farewell discourse between Jesus and the Spirit and God. And so uh, that, that, that unity or that... that um, that uh, uh, reality of the three of them, um, right, uh, is is so emphasized here, and so I think it's uh, it's a really it's a matter of I will not leave you orphaned, and because I am coming to you, but now in the presence of the Spirit, um, I wouldn't I wouldn't it wouldn't preclude though necessarily that I am coming to you uh, as the resurrected Jesus. And, uh, but I think I, like in, the, in this initial literary context, I think it probably references the advocate. Why do you ask, Matt? Because uh, I, I don't know is the, is the simple reason why, mm -hmm. why I ask. I just think it's, you know, and really hardcore Trinitarian people will probably get mad at me about this, but I, mean, I think it's really helpful for people to get a sense of that the the risen Christ or the ascended Christ is not just you know hanging out elsewhere, and the Holy Spirit isn't just some kind of a placeholder, but that we actually mm -hmm. talk about the the presence of the risen Christ being now not just here, but actually um, ascertainable, mm -hmm. um, detectable, 
manifested through the community of faith and that they're, you know, I don't want to get too hokey, but you know, the, the idea that, yeah, the, the presence of Christ is already here, right? That the, the, the Jesus body is still on earth mm-hmm. in the, um, in the people of faith, right? So, mm-hmm. which I think you can get out of Paul, you certainly can get out of Luke and Acts. I'm, I don't know if I'm just projecting that onto John or not. But that's valuable, especially to those of us who, um, like myself, who indwelled uh, traditions and denominations that are usually pretty poor on the Holy Spirit, really, poor, really pretty poor in pneumatology, and really don't know quite what to do with talk about the Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. But we're all for Jesus because we oh, know, yeah, yeah, does, right. We know what right. He says, and we know who He stands for, and so. Mm-hmm. Well, the joke in uh, my particular denomination is uh, the Holy Spirit is the shy member of the Trinity. Uh, but that is, uh, but the, the Holy Spirit in, in John, uh, like I said, is, it's a very unique pneumatology, but uh, it, uh, there really is no, I mean, there is a sense like the, that the disciples would feel a kind of uh, abandonment. <laughs> Uh, and orphanness were it not for the Holy Spirit. And then, of course, uh, in John 20 that we had, you know, for the Thomas story, uh, then the, Jesus actually breathes into them the Holy Spirit. So that presence of the Holy Spirit, uh, both alongside as the paraclete and within them is, is, uh, is the presence of Jesus, but it also makes possible, uh, you know, what Jesus will then send them out to do is to love the world. And I think it, just to support your, your comment too, uh, Matt, is that uh, in verse 19, because I live, you also will live. And so that's a, that's a really a direct, I think, foreshadowing of the promise of the resurrection and, uh, and particularly the resurrection appearances uh, and of, of seeing that, you know, seeing the, recognizing the resurrected Christ and how will that happen? And that becomes a really important aspect of, of the Jehanine uh, resurrection narratives is when is that moment of recognition? But that recognition does need to happen that this is the resurrected Jesus that has promised that I do live and, and then we'll be preparing that place for you. So in my Trinitarian understanding, this sense of um, God with us, and that Jesus is, has said uh, last week, uh, the text said, you know, what you see uh, me doing is, uh, is what the Father is doing, and uh, that pulls through to um, Jesus's absence, the Spirit's present, and we, by that Spirit, will do what Jesus did, and, and so it's not just... Um, it's not simply doing what Jesus did, but it's, it is in fact doing all that Jesus did, which is point to God the creator that is with us. And, and so that, that's how that all rolls together is that it's, it's not, um, you know, the, the, the whole discussion is how do we talk about one God when we have experienced this God in the person, in the flesh of Jesus. And now we are a called out community um, where truth is not an idea, but it is a person, and that person are Christ-like people, you and me, in the world, living out the mercy and presence of God. Maybe this is a good point at which to uh, make uh, a turn to the psalm. Um, at first blush, the psalm may look really odd, uh, in this case, but but I actually think it, it may, again, we are recording this on April 14th, so this is well over a month ahead of time, but Psalm um, 66, especially the part that is chosen uh, for this, is a communal psalm of thanksgiving. It should be translated, instead of bless our God, O peoples, it should be translated, praise our God, O peoples, let the sound of his praise be heard, who has kept us among the living and not let our feet slip. It's hard to forecast what's happening, but if, if the community of faith is able to gather again uh, soon, or even this, this particular Sunday, May 17th, this is, this is a perfect psalm 
uh, for uh, coming through any time of crisis, a pandemic, uh, in, you know, any time of crisis. And so it may be really appropriate at this time. You know, um, it uses all sorts of uh, different imagery. Uh, you brought us into the net, you laid our burdens back. That, that's a negative thing. That is the net is the image of judgment. It, for it says, God, you have tested us, you have tried us as silver. That's the image of the refining fire. So there's different images for, uh, for the time of crisis. We went through fire and through water. Again, that's the difference between the silver refined and the net. Um, but I, I, think our, I think our communities of faith don't often, as, a, as communities, reflect on God's presence, salvation, and redemption, and the way God brings us through, uh, as, as communities through times of crisis. We have such individualized notions of faith today that this may be a really appropriate time uh, to use Psalm 66. And even if you don't preach on it, uh, Caroline, um, you might want to use it. Liturgically, except I want to know what the fat lanes are. Oh, those are the um, like the year old, right? Uh, veal. The right? burnt offerings of fatlings. Yeah, so it's it's the one year old, um, you know, calf. Oh. Okay. So the most expensive offering you could make is a whole burnt offering. That usually, when you made an offering of an animal, you got a lot of it back, or the community ate it. But yeah. a whole burnt offering, you gave the whole thing away and didn't expect anything back. And the most expensive then was you fed this thing for a year and you've got nothing back from it. Oh, right. Okay. And it's, it's the choicest, you know, it's the choicest, uh, right. It's the difference between veal and mutton, you know, that's a big so, difference. I, I've never had mutton. I don't think, but um, once that's plenty anyway, in, in our culture, veal. but you can get the idea. How do you translate that to today? It's the most extravagant offering mm. you can give. Okay. Acts, the Areopagus speech. Yeah, this is great stuff. I like saying that word. Is the Areopagus, Areopagus. a place Areopagus. or a people, Matt? Uh, there's a debate about that. Uh, I, I think it's the people. I think this is the Areopagite Council, so to speak, as opposed to a place. I mean, this is where I've been to the Areopagus, though. So really, yeah. Say more. Tell us about this. Oh, no, I, I, it's, yeah, well, supposedly we're, you know, at the foot of the Parthenon, and <laughs> I actually climbed a little hill, that's the Areopagus Hill, climbed up to the top. Nice. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's the place traditionally where justice, where, you know, right. citywide decisions were made. It's mm -hmm. not clear that that was still held there in the first century or not, but this appears to be just the council of, I don't think Paul's on trial here, I think he's more of a curiosity, this is, this is a passage where you really have to set the context, I think, both what comes mm -hmm. before, who are these people, why is Paul called in front of them, uh, the curiosity about all this, who lived in Athens and what kind of reputation did the place have and how does that play on that to make this a more delightful story. But then also context at the end where Paul's sermon is interrupted and, or at least comes to an end and, and some some scoff, some say we want to hear more, and then there are some converts and some of them are named as well. So it's, it's worth bringing that in at the end and just kind of getting the, you know, the assessment report on the sermon or something like that uh, to see how it, how, it, how it went over. But it's, you know, it's a, it's a fascinating sermon because of an, well, a ton of reasons, but Paul is, is finding common ground with people. Paul is uh, working really hard to show his uh, ability to be conversant with Greek culture. He's quoting two different uh, poets here. There's um, a, a way in which almost everything in this sermon would have been really familiar to at least the Stoics in the audience, not so much the Epicurean, but definitely the Stoics would have been nodding along with everything going, yep, yep, we're with you. We agree that God doesn't exist in these, these things that we've made. But it's at the very end where he says uh, he's given assurance to all by raising somebody from the dead. And it appears that that's kind of a bridge too far for a lot of people because the idea of uh, an embodied resurrection, which appears to be more implied here than really stated explicitly, is not just distasteful, but just kind of nuts to most Greek thinkers uh, in that time. It appears that Paul has utterly misunderstood the essence of humanity, which is 
something that dwells within the body. And when the body is annihilated, that thing is set free. And Paul seems to be suggesting that there's still something rather important about who we are essentially as people that's connected to embodied existence. So it just makes him kind of kind of nutty from a Greek point of view. Mm -hmm. And I'm just in trouble for doing my role uh, that uh, Ralph uh, pointed out because for me, um, what was significant about this day in history is that in 1954, this is when the uh, Brown uh, versus Board of Education uh, decision um, uh, turned over the idea of separate but equal. And it becomes significant for me here because of the idea of an embodied self. And in a context where people were actually saying that it was the spirit that was more important than the material, um, that that is so much what we do when we get caught up in our um, a failure to recognize uh, that the embodied person is actually a representative of God in the flesh, as was Jesus. And, uh, and, and so th this idea of being able to converse across cultures and to be able to bear witness to God's inclusion of all is really powerful, I think, demonst powerfully demonstrated in this particular encounter. Yeah, I think that actually fits well with the, the, the historical note I made. Uh, right about uh, people being given up their own constitution. Um, I appreciate that reference. Matt, I have one, uh, I have a question though about the word assurance. Um, and of this, he has given assurance to all. Isn't the word faith in Greek? Pistine? Um, somebody asked me an X question regarding Greek and faith. Uh, I could just yeah, read I your book, but I don't go into this in my book. And I was actually in a conversation with uh, David Fredrickson about this recently. It was really interesting, but um, who also teaches with us at Luther Seminary. Uh, yeah, I believe, I'm not, I haven't had a chance to look it up in a hurry here, but I believe well, it I is. did. I mean, I know there that's what it is, but I want you to tell me what it means. Yeah, it's not the sense of faith and the sense of like utter belief, but it's this idea of, of pistis also meaning a sense of confidence. Um, a sense of, of trustworthiness, you know, reliability. Yeah, I mean, pistis means a lot of things, both in the Bible and, and in wider Greek usage, so. Yeah, I mean, Paul's point here is that, is that he, he's saying, look, we all live in a kind of uh, ignorance or unknowing around the divine and around the meaning of life. I mean, he's, it's part of the common ground here. So the question is, is there a God out there who has reached out to us in some way? Is there a God out there who wants to be knowable? And that's Paul's point in this, in this sermon is it doesn't come through incarnation, doesn't come through the miracles or the teachings or something like that. It comes from this clear sign that there is uh, more to this life than what we experience, which the Greeks all would have nodded along to, but then Paul's suggesting that it has something to do with um, a, a particular resurrection of a particular body uh, in a particular way. So there you have it. We should, turn to, we should turn to First Peter, and this is the end of uh, First Peter for a while, right? No, we have one more. One more. Easter 7. Got it. One more, two more we're left. We're recording, sorry, we're recording this ahead of time and I have not yet seen uh, Shively Smith's commentary on this, but I'm sure it's brilliant. I'm, How about that? How's that for an endorsement? She is uh, a leading to it. voice on First Peter and is working really hard to make me like First Peter more. And now just because she's so bold, she's working on a book on Second Peter. And if she can make that interesting, then I will uh, lay the crown of of 21st century new scholar, New Testament scholar uh, at her feet because anybody who devotes that, their time to first and second Peter is, uh, is a brave person, but she's brilliant. You're gonna lay that down. Um, in, Not in, that I possess it myself, I'm just saying, you know, but uh, she deserves it. Absolutely, and in, in, in leaning into what Ralph was just saying um, that, um, 
the comp the, or what we were discussing around confidence or faith and, and, and what that word means um, that even though we know that we will suffer, we can have the confidence to still choose God um, is, is how this uh, particular text reads to me in light of uh, the text we've already read for today. 